Welcome back to Spirit Talks. I'm your favorite host, Sharath. And we are going to talk about the spiritual journeys and esoteric uh, journeys of spiritual teachers and esoteric masters from different parts of the world. And we are back again with the lovely, gorgeous, and the mystical shaman and astrologer herself, Michelle Karen. Michelle, welcome back to my show, Spirit Talks. Thank you so much, Sharath. It's so, I'm so excited to be here again. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. So we spoke about uh, your life, about your childhood, about your psychic abilities, about your uh, awakening process, so to speak, and uh, how you became famous in uh, different regards in astrology and how you uh, delved into the La La Land, the, the, the magic <laughs> land of Hollywood acting and the song as well, which uh, made you famous. And, uh, you know, we had such fun. I mean, I had such fun talking to you and even I'm uh, pretty sure my audience as well enjoyed that uh, show, the uh, episode one uh, equally. And, you know, you gave us so much of uh, wonderful information. It was so educational, fun. It was brilliant. You know, I mean, you have so many different facets, positive facets to your life. And, uh, you know, I'm getting to know about your journey, unraveling your life journey as a spiritual master, shaman, astrologer, and, a, and an actress as well. You know, I haven't, uh, I mean, I don't know if anyone uh, have such uh, j life journeys. I mean, I haven't seen anyone who's an astrologer, shaman, and an actress. And I don't <laughs> think, uh, I mean, definitely this is historic. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure no, there's no one like you. So I, uh, I commend you for that. You're such an amazing person. Your vibes are very positive. You're such a wonderful person. So Thank uh, thanks for, uh, you know, being my guest again. You know, I mean, I'm so privileged and honored. I feel so blessed to be uh, hosting uh, the show with you. So my question in uh, this episode will be, um, let's uh, uh, plunge back into uh, your astrological journey you know, after your uh, acting and uh, Hollywood and stuff, basically. I mean, why did you transition into astrology? And my other question uh, will be, what is, uh, you know, how did shamanism and astrology happen? I mean, how do they go together? Tell me about your astrological journey and your shamanic journey and how is the confluence like? Yeah, so they started initiating me and I really did not understand what was going on at first. And it's when I came back to Arizona three months later that I realized I had changed. I had physically changed. I had a very hard time getting back to civilization. Um, and very shortly after, I returned to Peru, um, you know, on my own. And, uh, and then things continued there. And then they started asking me to bring people to Peru, which was very bizarre to me because I was not going to bring, to do any mystical trip or anything like that. It was absolutely not in my intentions. So I started, uh, so I, I put together, but they insisted so much. So I put together a, um, you know, a, a, a trip. And only one person signed up, so that was perfect. I had done it, it was not gonna happen. I refunded the person, done. But they insisted again, and this time I had five people signed up, and I was going to cancel it again. And uh, this one guy from Switzerland said, Michelle, you can't cancel the trip. I bought my shoes. I'm like, what? What kind of an argument is that? Uh, but I ended up doing the, the trip and throughout the trip we took pictures of his shoes because without his shoes never nothing would have happened. And uh, after that it never stopped. People kept asking me for to bring them to Peru and to work with the Kiros. And then one day the Kiros said to me, you have to teach shamanism. I'm like, no, 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 no. That is not happening, okay? This is not happening. And, um, and they said, well, no, it's okay. We will teach, you know, I'm going, it was my, my teacher, Don Pasquale, one of my teachers, Don Pasquale said, oh, well, that's okay. I will teach, bring me to LA. By that time I was living in LA again and, um, and I will do the school. I said, cool. Okay. I, I'll do that. So I gathered a few people who were interested in studying and uh, he came and it was quite a drama, his coming to LA. <laughs> um, okay, do you want the story? Do you want that story? Because it's a very funny story. Please, please, um, 
because the... you know, I want fun to be part of uh, this show as well. So please uh, <laughs> share the uh, tidbits of your, you know, the kind of well, stories you first... relate to my audience. So- First, I had to, you know, I was woken at four in the morning uh, by the police in Atlanta and they said, we have a very strange little man here because they're very short, the curls. And I asked him actually, why are you so short when you say you're coming from the Incas, you're descendants of the Incas, the Incas were very tall and you're very short. And Don Modesto, one of my teachers, took off his sandals because they always wear sandals, even though they were in the glaciers forever. And uh, he showed the sole of his feet and he said, oh, it's because we walked so much. It took it to rub off. <laughs> Skin <laughs> come, came off. So they have a great sense of humor. They, they take themselves, uh, they take their work extremely seriously, but they don't take themselves very seriously. And uh, so at four in the morning, I'm woken up by the customs in uh, Atlanta and they say we have this weird little guy who has a strange attire, who doesn't speak any language, but he had a paper with my name and my, my address so, and my phone number, that's why they found me and called me. And, uh, and he has feathers. What feathers are these? And I'm like, oh no, he brought his condor feathers. <laughs> this is not good. I did not remember to tell him that this is illegal here. So anyway, so I pretended I did not know what they were. Um, and, um, and they just confiscated those feathers and he landed in LA. And I had told him, stay in the airport. I'm coming to get you. Don't worry. And when I arrived, he was nowhere to be seen. And I found him completely by accident because he was so short and others, you know, people are tall. And right. he was in the middle of the crowd outside of the airport waiting for me. So I had another of my students was coming and uh, from Finland. So I put him in the car in the parking lot and I said, wait for me. I'm going to go and get this other student who is coming from Finland. And she was going through customs in LA and it was taking forever and it took literally forever so I'm thinking oh probably he's hungry so I grabbed something at Starbucks I went back to the car I get to the car this is LA okay middle of the parking lot underground parking lot the car is completely open with all the bags everything there and no Carol in sight And I'm thinking, oh my God, where did he go? So I'm trying to think as a Cairo, you know, and where would he go? So I'm thinking a tree, something natural, you know, and there's no tree here. So I'm like pacing up and down the parking lot thinking, where in hell could he be? And um, and all of a sudden, half an hour later, he's just like happily coming out, you know, through the parking lot walking. He had gone to the bathroom. (laughs) And I'm like, what? I said, okay, you stay in the car, lo- I'm locking you in and you stay there. You know, I was very happy with the food and the, the chance of him getting lost, right? <laughs> you were so scared. Oh gosh. So I went back to get my other student and finally she arrived. Now everybody's in the car. I'm like, Phew. okay, we're good. <laughs> and I dropped my friend, um, my student off, and then I dropped him. I had rented an Airbnb for him so that he would be um, comfortable. And it happened to be in a, in a house that was not very far from my house, but still you had to drive to go between the two places. And it was owned by this um, elderly lady who used to be, um, I think she was an opera singer or something like that. She, she used to be famous, but I had no idea who she was. Anyway, she was very lovely. He had his own room, his own bathroom, you know, everything was good. So I said to him, look, I, you know, rest and I will come and get you in the morning for the school. So, you know, I brought him food and everything and I go home, I prepare my apartment and all that for the next day. The next morning I arrive, as I said, at 7 a.m. And this poor lady, she is like totally in disarray. Her hair all over the place. Her, she's in her, you know, nightgown, and she's like, Michelle, you look like a nice lady, but seriously, he cannot stay here. And I'm like, what happened now? <laughs> you know? Well, it so happened that she had uh, a couple, uh, an Australian couple, staying with her. And um, and after I left, you know, he had offered um, healings 
And um, actually, just before I left, he had offered healing. So because he didn't speak English or anything, I translated for him. And I said in front of that couple and to that lady that he was a shaman from Peru and he wanted to offer healings if they were interested. And the Australian lady got up and she's like, I only accept healing from our Lord Jesus the Christ. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this is not good at all. <laughs> this is not good. Uh, so I said, okay, okay, that's fine. Um, and I told, you know, Don Pasquale, just, you know, I don't think they're really interested in healings. We're all good, everything good. Well, after I left, that lady got so concerned about the elderly lady that she started doing all these prayers on her to save her soul and etc. and etc. And when she was done, the husband took over and do, started doing that. And when they were done, Don Pasquale thinking, oh, it's prayer time with his call, you know, his, his thing, his, um, his uh, rattle and his stones and his mesa, you know, that's the mesa that you get when you become a shaman. Um, he just starts to do healing on her. You know? <laughs> and the poor woman, she was an atheist. She didn't believe in anything. And she's like, what happened to me? Why do all these people pray on me? I don't even believe in prayer. I don't believe in anything. And when that was over, he started going for a walk and it's LA. So he has all his, you know, his poncho, red poncho, and he's a small guy. What is it called? What is it called again for my viewers? Uh, it's just a poncho, you know, it's their, it's their ceremonial poncho that's very red and white and very beautiful, very ornate. And they have this hat, you know, with a big hat and it shows the level of the shaman. It shows all the who you are as a shaman very decorated with beads and with a pom-pom. I mean, honestly, even in Hollywood, even in LA, where people sometimes are coming out of a movie set, you know, at 7 a.m., he looked a little out of place even there. <laughs> got it. And, uh, and after a while, he got a little tired of walking up and down the street. So he sat on the side of the street and he's just sitting there. And the neighbors who know that this is an elderly lady, she has people coming and renting rooms from her, and you know, she, they keep an eye on her, which is a nice thing to do as neighbors, right? Uh, they got a little concerned and they called the police. <laughs> now the police shows up. <laughs> it was one thing after the other. And the police shows up and of course he doesn't speak anything. He doesn't speak English, he doesn't speak anything. So. Um, you know, they got also a little concerned, um, and that's why this lady said, no, 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 we, we, he can't stay here. But I said, look, I'm sorry, please, 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 he won't be around, I will pick him up in the morning, leave him at night to sleep, it's just to sleep here, so please, please, please. So she said, okay. Uh, and then, so that's the first day. We haven't even started the first day, okay? So we are coming to my house, and uh, I say to him in the car, I say, well, so what are you going to teach to uh, teach us today? And he said, oh, I'm not teaching. I said, excuse me? I said, what do you mean you're not teaching? And he said, no, 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 you are teaching. I said, no, 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 you don't understand. I have students. They came to be taught by you. What am I going to talk about? I mean, no, 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 no. And he just met me there. And the students were there and the school is starting. And he's sitting next to me eating cookies. He loved my cookies. And I was left to make, teach. So you make cookies as well? No, I, well, no, <laughs> I don't really have time uh, or the interest, but I could, but no, not now. <laughs> anyway, I had bought those cookies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and I started teaching and five days went by and I taught for five days. He didn't teach, he just was munching on cookies. But there was one drama after the other because the next day he wanted to call his wife and his kids in Peru so we we called them and uh and the kids are freaking out because the mother's bleeding to death i mean there's all these things going on and uh, he's very relaxed very tranquil you know all like 
there, you know, peaceful. And uh, and I said, well, shouldn't we do something? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, you do your distance healing thing that I had taught the previous day. And, and he's just sitting there on the couch while I'm doing my thing, you know, and like a little freaking out because this is a serious matter. And I'm doing my healing the way I, I, I learned how to do it. And I'm doing it. And he's like munching on cookies. That's all he did for five days. <laughs> and, um, and then I said, well, uh, he said, oh, very good. And then I said, well, shouldn't we call to see how she's doing? And he said, yeah, sure, if you want. So we called. I mean, he's so relaxed over the whole thing. And I'm the one freaking out. So, he's, uh, so we called his wife. And uh, indeed, things had stopped. The bleeding had stopped. Everything had stopped. He said, you see, you're very good. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, what am I into? And then I realized later on that really... He was just, it, he just tricked me. That was the, you know, he knew I was not going to teach. He knew I was not super confident in my abilities to do healings. And it was just a trick to just get me to do it. And right. it worked. It totally it worked, worked. right? It worked. <laughs> and he made my life unbearable. He really did. Because also the last Fun, night, right? freaking out. It's like, Hucha, hucha, and hucha means in um, in um, in Quechua, it means you know dark energy, and I'm like, what happened? What happened? And there was like a little bit of dust under his bed, and I'm like, you're a shaman. I mean, what the hell? You know, can't you deal with hucha? I mean, this is what we do as shamans, right? Uh, so anyway, he couldn't stay in that house. He had to stay at my place. Uh, and I was not too excited about that because I was not living in a big, big home in, in uh, Hollywood, you know. So I was not really excited about that. But anyway, he made it hell so that I had to get him. And then he wanted us to wash his sheet every day. And, and I said, we can't do that. You know, we are in a drought here in L.A. We have to conserve water. We can't even take two showers a day. We have to be very careful with water. We can't even at the time we could even water our lawns. I mean, come on. And then as I'm driving through LA, you know, he saw homeless people and he couldn't understand the concept because in Peru, if somebody is homeless, everybody's going to help out. He couldn't understand how people in what is supposed to be a, a, a rich country would be homeless. You know, so there were all sorts of things that were not computing for him because it was such a jump in, in consciousness, in civilization, in history, and everything. So it was actually quite different, complicated. It's a different journey again. Different journey, yeah, like astrology. And, way of and, then, and then on top of that, I still had the customs on my back. You know, they were writing and calling and wanting to know about those feathers. And, uh, and there he is, you know, throwing coca leaves and coca leaves are, you know, the way of divination for the, so I don't even know how he made it with coca leaves, to be honest, through the customs, they didn't see it, I guess, but he had coca leaves with him. So he's throwing the coca leaves and I'm like going through all the stuff that they're asking me to answer, you know, the customs. And I'm saying, um, Don Pasquale, we have to say the truth. These are condor feathers. It, and he's like, no, the coca leaves say we have to lie. And I said, no, 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 we cannot lie. I don't care what the coca leaves say. We cannot lie. We have to say the truth. This is customs. This is the FBI. This is I don't know who they are. Uh, they are going to find out anyway. So we can't lie. No, 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 the coca leaves. I said, stop with the coca leaves. We can't. We have to say things as they are. Um, so I mean, we were like in La La Land there. <laughs> And then we had to go. So I, I, I did say the truth, and they, and and I talked to them on the phone, and I tried to explain he's not here to stay. You know, this is this instrument of work. This is what you know they were uh, gotten ethically in Peru. He's going back to Peru. This is where he works. He needs his his feathers anyway. The whole they never accepted that, and they ended up destroying them. Which was really sad, that was, but that was, mm. that's how it went. So anyway, uh, then, Michelle, uh, I wanted to ask you this, uh, uh, the part two of the question. Uh, so tell me about the confluence of uh, astrology and uh, uh, shamanism. And then later I'm going to ask you about your astrological journey and charts and definitely your other talent writing and your books as well. But tell me, I mean, how 
they are correlated how do you you know uh, correlate and have a confluence of astrology and shamanism which is now what you are practicing they are actually very complementary of each other because astrology is based on the stars obviously and it gives very specific cycles and dates and so it's very mental in many ways you know you're reading charts whereas shamanism is energetic you know you listen to nature if an owl uh, lands on your balcony it has a meaning it has a message uh if you know uh you find uh you know um, a reindeer crosses your path it has a, a message a meaning and so i find that um for me it's very it's wonderful to have both those uh those techniques so i don't know if you call them techniques or those arts more like it uh because in astrology i can go so far but you know i can explain things to people and and make them aware of certain things of cycles and how to ride those cycles elegantly and in shamanism we can do some deeper energetic work you know like it's to me shamanism is like indigenous psychotherapy and when we are able we can work on the past we can resolve things and it's very there's a lot of images everything is image images in shamanism which really helps also people understand so even in astrology i won't say you know you have saturn in the sixth house blah 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 because most people it flies right over their head and it doesn't add anything and i myself as an astrologer i'm very annoyed by when i read astrological reports where they give all this astrological jargon uh because what you want is interpretation and even as an astrologer even if i know what these things mean i still want the interpretation of what others how others see it or what is their understanding of it and i think um you know that that's a bit the, the astrology can become very mental whereas shamanism is never mental it's always at a feeling level at an imaginary you know you, you see images it's not imagination but it's seeing images you wow. journey you work with your dreams you work with the language of your psyche which is images so it's wonderful to have those two to be able to navigate between the two and to to use both to help people live a much more conscious happier fulfilled life that's where i'm uh, heading tell me what is because you know i have uh, heard uh, you are a quantum astrologer tell me how your life as a quantum uh, quantum uh, astrologer is like and uh, what is uh, quantum astrology because there are a lot of uh, things you know which you know i mean please clear the air of quantum astrology for all the viewers of money tv international well i did not say that uh to myself uh, i did not talk about uh quantum astrology it was a channeling of lee carol channeling cryon who said that i am a master astrologer uh the first one to bring quantum astrology to this planet and that i read the akashic records directly and um and he said that in several channelings so but i was very grateful for that for one very specific reason was that there was something i was doing in astrology that i never understood that never made sense because as an astrologer and i'll tell you the story is that i was in latvia at the time and i was giving a conference there and at the time i used to see people uh you know do readings in person i don't anymore i do them on the phone or on skype but i don't do them in person anymore and at that time so i had all these people coming you know and seeing me and uh this lady i'm doing her reading and she's like wow that's exactly true this is what happened i mean everything i was saying she was saying yes 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 and then she looks over my shoulder and she says wait a minute i wasn't born in may I wasn't born in 66. Uh I'm not that's not my chart. And I'm thinking, "Oh, no." And she said, "But everything you said to me was correct. How is that possible?" I said, "Well, and I had zero explanation. 
I said, well, I guess astrology works in mysterious ways because I really had no explanation. It didn't make sense to me either. How could I be reading correctly the wrong chart? It didn't make sense because astrology is very mathematical. It's based on mathematics. So, you know, it's not something you invent stuff. It, you read what is there. So right after that lady came the rightful owner of that chart and I should have read it technically exactly the same way because I was reading twice in a row the same chart. Well, the interpretation was completely different and that makes no sense. That makes no sense. Saturn and Capricorn is Saturn and Capricorn, period. You, you just... You know, it's not it's not in another sign. It's it's like it makes no sense. Uh, so when that channeling came through, it explained to me what I was doing is that I was actually using the chart in order to access information that was um, quantum, that was in the quantum field, that was multidimensional, and that I was able. Wow. To, and sometimes I get images of past lives for people. Sometimes. So I don't consider myself psychic, really, um, because I do need a, a drawing of a chart to speak. I can't do it like that. I can't look at you and start talking. I can't. Um, so I'm still reading the chart, and I have a very extensive knowledge of astrology. I studied at the Faculty of Astrological Studies in London. I've read I don't know how many books. I've done thousands and thousands and thousands of charts. So I, I have a very solid knowledge of astrology, but I'm doing something that goes somewhat beyond that I don't know. And I see threads of colors. And when I look at a chart, the, the planets start to talk to me. I see images, I see things, uh, but I need the drawing of, a, of an astrological map to be able to speak. Michelle, uh, I mean, such a wonderful explanation about quantum astrology to all of our viewers of Manu TV International about I mean, what exactly it is, what is your insight on that and you know, you're, you're being so humble and uh, uh, so innocent at times where you said that you're not a psychic and things but but I can see so many psychic abilities in you I mean from the, from the, from the kinds of uh, things I've re read about you in magazines and your different uh, interviews as well and you and I've, and I know your real work toward humanity at large my question is uh, I mean, uh, it's a little paradoxical but uh, as you said you are a person who you know deals with mathematics the charts and stuff and you also said that uh, I mean as, as well Kryan as well said that you are a master astrologer who can peek into the Akashic records and tell their past lives or maybe bring about bring out dig out uh, whatever is there in their uh, records there so how do you combine these and is is there any connection with the shamanic journey of yours as well do you also do you integrate all your uh, technical skills when you do a reading how do you do your reading actually that's a very difficult question. Um, no, I have my astrology brain and my shaman brain. <laughs> so it's very different. And when I'm reading a chart, I'm not bringing in my shamanic knowledge. And when I do my shamanic work, I do not bring the astrology in. It's two very separate, but they complement each other. So it's good to have both. You know, if somebody really wants to do serious work on themselves, it's great to know what your astrology is saying, what the cycles are about, when they will end, how long they will last, and what you and how to write elegantly all the changes that are occurring. And with shamanism, we create a mythic map. You know, we, for example, if you do a soul retrieval for someone, uh, if we have had, like, for example, a shock and we were not ready to integrate the lesson we go into a, um, a soul loss. So part of our soul just detaches and goes into the void. And the work of the shaman is to journey to get it back and retrieve it so that the person can be whole again and function as an entire entity in their lives. 
and and the problem also of soul loss, which happens, you know, if for example we are serve divorced people and we're not ready for that, or we're not expecting that, or we had a car accident, or we we saw something horror horrible that we couldn't process. Um, you know, the problem is that we reincarnate even as fragmented beings. And this is why even today, um, there are some people you can give them all the love, all the consciousness in the world, and it will go into a black hole because their souls are not complete. They are, they are fragmented. So it's, uh, the role of the shaman is very different from the role of the astrologer. You know, the astrologer is going to give you dates. He's going to give you um, a plan that's very linear. Whereas in shamanism, we enter sacred time, which is circular time. So it's actually very interesting to have those two parts of my brain functioning. Right. <laughs> it's kind of a dichotomy, but I mean, somehow you balance both of them well. I'm, 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 well I'm, it makes me feel more complete, you know, even in my personal life, because I pay tremendous attention to animals that are crossing my path. I'm always uh, researching the metaphysical properties of plants. Uh, and again, I don't do Awayasca or San Pedro, the Keros do not. And I absolutely do not believe that this is even necessary on a shamanic path. So I'm a drugless uh, shaman. And, um, and I pay a lot of attention to my dreams. Like I keep a dream journal and I write my dreams in the morning and I I type them out. I study them. I mean, it's I, I I live in that world of of vision of images, and there's so much information, and it, it gives so much wealth and richness to life when you you pay attention to all those things. So I'm constantly listening to messages from nature, and that's how I like to re to live. I don't go and look at the ephemerides every day. You know, I have to because people ask me, where is the moon? Where is this? Where is that? You know, and I have to keep a little track of all that. But I don't, that's not my first thought in the morning to check what's going on in the stars. I try to stay away from that as much as possible. But I check my chart, I check my transits, which is how the planets are affecting my natal chart uh, when, you know, from time to time where there is um, something I'm not understanding, or why is this happening, or why is there a series of things happening like that, then I will check my chart. But I think it's important to live in a more intuitive way, you know, to, to be very present to the present and to be as normal as possible, because I see that so much in the spiritual realms, people who become so dissociated from normal life and normal people that right. you become out of reach and out of touch with reality. And as a shaman, that's the nice thing about it is that we have to be very grounded. You know, it's not a path of la la land. It's not a path of spiritual imagination. It's right. a path where everything is very concrete and everything is verified and everything has meaning you know it's more real than the real world i mean it's it's, it's about well, energy it's not more real than the real world i wouldn't say that but it's it makes the real world more meaningful richer more full more uh expensive you're talking about more abundance yes absolutely Correct. it's wonderful My paying attention to our dreams is amazing sorry <laughs> yes I, I'll, I'll definitely start uh, uh, maintaining a dream journal from now on. I mean, I had that in mind for a while, but now you reinforce that uh, you know, thought in my mind. I'll definitely do that. Thanks. And thanks for now, you dreams. know, and especially now with all the stuff that's going on in the world, we really need to pay attention to our dreams because you know, amazing things come from our dreams. Um, novels came out of dreams. Painting came out of dreams. Songs came out of dreams. Uh, musical compositions came out of dreams. Even scientific uh, discoveries came out of dreams. Or archaeological, you know, um, uh, connections came out of dreams. So it's very important. And one of the keys is to not 
wake up and you know not change positions when you wake up in the morning and try to first thing don't get up don't drink any water just focus on gathering images from your dream and write them down in whatever you remember if it's an image if it's a word if it's whatever it is and that will pull the rest of the dream in and do not try to interpret your dreams either just put a title a uh, date and a time and a place if you travel as much as I do uh, I also put the place and um, and what I do in my dream journal is that I put it on the right hand side and the left I keep blank and I will write things that come to me you know like what was going on in my life at the time of the dream or uh, is there, you know, anything that afterwards, you know, or research, like um, one time I was dreaming of this big bowl of beautiful oranges. So I started researching what does orange stand for? What is the color? What is the fruit? What is the metaphysical properties, the healing health properties of the fruit? So I started writing all that in the left hand side. And that's how you work with your dreams. So don't try to get a dictionary of dreams because that's it works for the person who wrote it, but nobody else. <laughs> um, right. And uh, and don't try to interpret your dreams either. Just let the meaning unravel. And maybe it won't, or maybe it will, a month later, a week later, a year later. But just let it simmer. Let let it be there in the background, and then the rest will develop that, from there. I mean that. Uh, with that, uh, a question arises in my mind uh, right now, Michelle. So with that, uh, I mean, you know, that was uh, really wonderful about your your deep insights about uh, dreams and the dream journal and writing about, you know, whatever pops in your mind without any interpretations and uh, any uh, preconceived notions in your mind. My question is, I mean, um, suppose I maintained a dream journal, suppose from tomorrow, and uh, I did that for a couple of months or maybe six months, I, I'm writing down whatever is popping in my mind. The first thing in the morning, I write down everything. Uh, <clears throat> to make sense for that journal, is there any way to go back uh, back in time when you started or to some of the pages? And is there any any way to actually, you know, uh, read them at leisure and find out what's going on in your life? Or is there oh, any yes. other way to use it? Yeah, definitely. That's very important to go back to your dreams because we it's important to start to become acquainted with your dream landscape. Like I know, for example, when I dream that I'm moving, I it means in my life that I'm changing levels of consciousness, you know, that a new chapter is opening in my life. But that's me. And then sometimes you we may dream of someone and it's not about that person, but it is what that person represents in my life. You know, uh, sometimes it is about that person. And then it's recognizing uh, the types of dreams because they are premonitory dreams. They are, you know, that are announcing something that's going to happen. Or there are dreams that are just, you know, stress dreams where you're just releasing the stress of the day. Or there are dreams that are reminding you of something. Or uh, there are dreams, um, there are recurring dreams. And these are very important to pay attention to because these are dreams that are coming with little variations, but it's always the same dream. And it's something we are working out. And for example, if we encounter in our dreams a difficult situation or a dangerous person, it's very important to face that situation. And we have to endeavor in our dream to face that person and not run away or face that situation and not run away. So we can, and as we work things out in our dream world, we are also going to affect our waking hours and our this reality. I don't know which reality is more real, honestly. <laughs> I think both are real in a different way. And we spend a lot of time dreaming and sleeping. And it's important that we also use that to continue our growth. Because really, I believe our life is to reach enlightenment. You know, our life is to reach happiness and is to be joyful and to fulfill our highest destiny, which is to be as complete as we can be, as transparent as we can be. And dreams help us enormously in reaching that 
go i think correct correct wonderful wonderful that reminds me of one story of a zen master where uh, i mean i'll just sum up quickly uh, he uh, he said that uh, uh, in my dream i woke up as a butterfly and when i woke mm -hmm. up now i am a human being now he started asking his disciples now i don't know who i am am i a butterfly or a human being so as you said we don't know and i think uh, the spiritual quest will eventually uh, let us know and I, i know that you will as well enlighten our uh, uh, audience and me with the different insights and golden nuggets about spirituality and astrology and shamanism the question i wanted to ask you is just off the off the show uh when you said you have to even those even the so, uh, the spiritual people they got dissociated and you know they get uh, distracted and uh, different things and it, there is a need to come uh, present and uh, be present in the moment yeah how much ever i uh, i mean i i meditate i do a lot of things and i do i mean be positive i read different things and of course i'm into all of these things I'm pretty sure in your mental eye or in your mind or in your heart so what is the best way to be uh, present to the moment you know, without your well, mind interfering just do that he says you're very focused on what is in front of you you don't let your mind go all over the place you know you empty your mind i mean It, it's tough for me because my mind is always empty, so pretty much. So then I'm just where I am. I'm just focused on what I'm focusing on. You know, I'm not thinking in the past and the future. You know, because uh, I mean, a lot of people in these times as well. I mean, they have the worry that what will happen to my job and my money and yeah. my parents and. Well, well I think. Well, you know, but that's like putting a hypothetical future. We don't know. You know, unless something hits you, don't don't extrapolate. You know, don't start to go into hypothetical whatever because we don't know if it's going to happen or not. You know, there's so much uncertainty. How to stop right? that? How to stop that worry? You know, and come back. Any is there any technique for that or? Well, I think the best technique is just to be focused on what's in front of you, to to discipline your mind, to not start to go into a probable future. Because the truth is, we have many possible futures, and it may or may not happen, you know. So, and we are the creators of our reality, if you think about it. So it's how do we, if we worry, we are creating what we're worrying about. You know, there's an Indian, there's an Indian saying saying that man is a creature of reflection. Whatever he reflects upon, he manifests, and that's true. So if we if we start to focus to be fearful of losing our job, or we're going to create that. And why? You know, let us focus on. I have a wonderful job. I'm making lots of money. My life is good. I'm taken care of. You know. Correct. So How about uh, I mean suppose you are living with someone and uh, uh, I mean if I have to see I, I mean I have my own beliefs I have, I have my own things to do like I do my affirmations and all that and their energy kind of stops me to do what I'm doing. How to how do I you know suppose I have to approach you for a reading. Uh, suppose I have to uh, come to your things to your journey to become a shaman or all of that. If how to block. those energies out and you know actually start doing because you know sometimes even that's i'm part tough. of this mess that's tough you know that's why i live alone to be honest <laughs> because huh? i mean, i feel that i don't think it's that natural to live with someone i mean i have views on marriage at all a little my own uh but i don't think i i don't i think we we should be with others when we want to be with others but even with our marriage partner we should not necessarily live together you know i i think it's not completely natural i mean i i really believe in freedom and i really believe that we can be very committed to another but at the same time we should be not necessarily in each other's space all the time because energetically no two people are so perfectly matched that it's going to be heaven all the time and even living alone is not always easy either you know because there's times where it would be nice to not be alone so it's it's about finding the right balance between being alone and being together 
we'll be back on spirit talks in the next episode and we'll talk more about her books and uh, uh, her readings and uh, different aspects uh, of her life as well which we did not uh, complete and then we'll uh, have some more fun time with michelle and let's wait for episode three thank you michelle thanks everybody i hope uh, all of you are enjoying this is your host sharat and uh, have fun time <laughs>